Whitmire is basically just saying, increase in cases, therefore, we need another shutdown. And he does mention hospitals, but he uses garbage stats and doesn't explain that. Now, if Kyle Whitmire can come to me and say, look, and, and not use anecdotal evidence and say, well, there may have been some hospitals that ran out of ICU beds. Now, that's not what I'm talking about. Come to me with actual math and actual data and say, look, this is Alabama's overall ICU capacity. This is where we are. This is where we're projected to be. And where we're projected to be exceeds where we will have to be. And so that's why we need to flatten the curve and enact another shutdown. Then I'm open to listening, but he hasn't done that. He's basically just said, oh, increase in cases. Therefore, we need another shutdown. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. So let's go ahead and read this article from AL.com's Kyle Whitmire. So the headline is, Wait and see is over. Do something now, K. Ivy. I'm sorry, Governor Ivy, but it's time to talk about coronavirus restrictions again. No one wants them. Heck, no one even wants to talk about them. But it's time. Just look at the numbers. On May 13th, Alabama posted 349 new cases. That was the day you first relaxed restrictions that had kept the restaurants, gyms, and salons closed. On Tuesday, Alabama reported nearly 10 times that number of cases, 3,376. Yes, those cases include some backlog tests from the Thanksgiving holiday, but the numbers are still bad. Okay, so I, first of all, I love that he includes this statistic and then acknowledges that it's a bad number. See saying that this is how many cases that we posted on this one particular day, even though we know for a fact that there were multiple tests that just got recorded on that day and got reported. It wasn't that they all happened in one day. It's just I have to find the biggest, scariest number I possibly can. So he admits that it's a bad stat. He admits it's one that you shouldn't be going by, but then proceeds to use it and cite it as a rationale for why Governor Ivey needs to do what he says. It's it's so ridiculous because here's the thing. The 14-day average, the real 14-day average for what we're in right now when it comes to cases is 2,308 a day. Now, that is still significantly more than the 349 cases that were posted on the day that Governor Ivey relaxed the restrictions and, and opened the state back up, but it's not 10 times as much. That's a 1,000 less than the number that he just cited because what they did was a lot of the tests got backlogged and they all got reported on the same day. Kyle Whitmire knows that. He admits it in the article, but hey, it fits my narrative and it sensationalizes my point. Ergo, I'm going to use it even though I know it's a garbage stat. Because to Kyle Whitmire and other people in the media that have this weird shutdown fetish, that's really all that matters. As long as they can convince people that they ought to be terrified, they feel like they've done their job. And if they have to use bad stats to use it, then by gum, that's what they're going to do. And Kyle Whitmire straight up admits this in his article. Furthermore, using the day after the shutdown, that's an incredibly stupid metric to use anyway. Like, it would be one thing if he just arbitrarily picked some random date and compared it to right now. But he specifically used one after the shutdown. Now, shutdowns do cause a decrease in cases. Now, overall, they don't. Like, if you're looking at the amount of cases of a country like Sweden who had virtually no shutdowns versus a country like Germany that shut down really hard, you'll notice that the cases as a percentage of their population is pretty close to the same. And so the only difference is that Germany's was spread out over a longer period of time. You know, Sweden got hit really hard, really fast, and then everything calmed down because a whole bunch of their people got it essentially all at once. But if you're looking at the overall cases, the shutdowns are not an effective measure for lowering the total amount of people that get the virus and never have been. In fact, even back when the shutdowns were being touted as being a, a really smart policy, nobody ever suggested that this was going to keep people from getting the virus. All they suggested is it is going to flatten the curve and slow everything down to allow the system to absorb the burden that these cases are going to cause. And so citing the stats 
the day after a shutdown? In other words, after you've had everybody shut down and not able to come out of their house and that kind of thing, that's kind of like citing if you were to make this analogous to cancer. That would be like if you looked at your numbers right after your final day of chemo. Uh, well, of course your tumor markers are going to be down after you just took your final day of chemo, but that's not a good comparison to tell whether or not they're normal or not. What you should be looking at and comparing is an average day, one that you haven't just gone through chemo on. And so this is a really bad rubric, but the reason that Kyle Whitmire puts it out there is because he takes a garbage stat that's going to be inflated and he knows is inflated and admits it, and then takes another stat that he knows is going to be super low and one that he can say, look how we are doing compared to that. O okay, but that's not really a good measure. Why don't we measure sometime later? Why don't we measure sometime, you know, like two weeks after the state opened up, something like that? Because, uh, you know, that would be a much better measure of what's going on here. But then he continues on in the same article. As of Tuesday, 1,785 people were hospitalized with the virus. That's more than three times as many that were hospitalized when you began lifting restrictions. Some hospitals have already run out of ICU beds, and even if they rustle up some more, they can't magically hire more staff to tend them. Okay, there's a couple of reasons why this is incredibly dumb. First of all, you may recall that the stat that he is citing here, it goes all the way back to May. He's saying that this is because that would have been the time that the shutdown officially ended and KIV loosened the restrictions on the state. The problem with using that is, since then, we have changed how we measure hospitalizations. Completely changed it. And the numbers are way higher now than they were back then. Now, you could argue maybe whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing when it comes to how we're recording it. Maybe we were missing some under the old system that we're seeing now. You know, that's a perfectly fine discussion to have, but regardless of where you fall on that discussion, we're measuring it different now, and we're reporting it different now. And because of that, there is absolutely no way you can compare that stat to this stat. It would be like saying, for example, a 20 centimeter long piece of wood is longer than a 10 inch piece of wood because 20 is higher than 10. The only problem with that is, you're measuring one in centimeters, you're measuring the other in inches, and a 10-inch piece of wood is actually longer than a 20-centimeter piece of wood. You see, you can't just throw two completely different systems of measurement together and say, oh, the higher one must be significantly uh, longer or bigger or however you're measuring that. And so you're using two completely different systems of measurement here, yet you're comparing. It's like, well, it's, it's three times the amount of hospitalizations under the old, uh, under the... Uh, that we're having now as opposed to May, but we were using a completely different system that measured it in smaller increments then. And so Kyle Whitmire is either completely ignorant that this change took place on July the 10th and the Alabama Department of Public Health announced it. Maybe he just forgot about that and just looked at the raw numbers and it was a oops. But considering that Kyle Whitmire has already openly admitted to, in this same article, using garbage statistics as long as it makes his case stronger, I kind of doubt that he is just ignorant of this and just wanted to use a number that makes his case look stronger than it actually is. But, you know, that really should come as no surprise to anybody that's familiar with Whitmire's work. And then another piece of this article, our percent positive rates have risen above 25% in parentheses, anything above five is bad, which means we're missing positive cases. Um, not necessarily. We might. It's possible. If our, percent po uh, if our percentage positive is higher, then what that means is we are testing a lower percentage of the overall population. Why is that? Because it's important to ask why. Well, there are several reasons. One could be that more people have had the virus now and therefore are not getting the virus. And because we've had that big spike and there's a whole bunch of people we have in the state living already that survived the virus and have no chance of getting it from now on, or at least at any time in the near future, then that means that there's no reason for them to get tested again. Ergo, we are test we're not testing those same people over and over. And so that's part of it. But another one is, 
a lot of these people that we're missing are asymptomatic and very unlikely to, tr to transmit it anyway. Remember, originally, we were really scared about this thing because we're like, yeah, it doesn't really manifest until about three or four days after you have the virus. And at that point, you could have spread it to all kinds of people, except we found out that asymptomatic people tend to not spread the virus. That if you're completely asymptomatic, that you're not feeling sick in any way, that normally speaking, that's not a person that transmits. Asymptomatic transmission is still possible, but it's very unlikely. And this has been proven the more familiar we've gotten to this virus and the more we've studied it. And so the fact that we're missing a whole bunch of asymptomatic people or people that have incredibly mild symptoms is really not that big a deal. And the reason our percent positive rate is going up, it means more people that don't have the virus just aren't getting tested. And there's a number of reasons that that could be the case. He sort of arbitrarily just says, well, anything above five is bad. Uh, okay, why? Explain yourself. I mean, maybe you have a point, but you got to show your work on that. You can't just say something like that and then expect everybody to fall in line and believe you. And this is the final piece of this particular article we'll read. Whitmire says, if you don't put in place immediate, uh, immediate mitigation measures now, you won't have to worry about shutting down the state. Eventually, it will shut itself down. Yeah, that's the argument I've been making since day one. Good job, Kyle Whitmire. You just figured out Libertarianism 101. That's the point. You see, what we learned from this virus when the first wave of shutdown started is that most people were quarantining for days or weeks before their state officially shut down. You can look at data when it came to people traveling. You can look at self-reported data. Uh, you can look at the data of cell phones and, and GPSs. The New York Times actually did this, where they were tracking whether or not people were moving around and how much people were driving, that kind of thing. And what they found is that every single state, all 50 of them, every single one saw a significant dip in travel about a week and a half before their state shut down. Why? Because the numbers started getting worse and people started quarantining themselves. This is the difference in somebody like me and somebody like Kyle Whitmire. See, I believe that people will make decisions in their own self-interest. That if they know that the virus is, is getting worse and it may be something that is a problem, they will self-quarantine. And if they don't, then they're not going to. You see, that's the problem with all these government mandates. I don't have a problem with somebody who's like, you know what, I'm kind of vulnerable, or you know what, I'm not vulnerable, but somebody that I live with is. I live with my, my dad or my granddad, and because of that, I'm just going to be a little extra cautious, and since I can work from home, will, that's fine. I got no problem with that. What I have a problem with is somebody in the government telling a small business that they're not allowed to open their doors even if it starves their family because the state is shut down. That's what I have a problem with. If they want to shut down or they want to, you know, take some extra precautions, okay, that's fine. The state mandating it is not correct. And Kyle Whitmire kind of inadvertently actually makes a really good point, which is if you don't shut it down, the state is going to shut down itself. Yeah, because people act in their own self-interest. And if they want to shut down, that should be their decision, not the governor's. That's the point I've been making since day one. And somehow Kyle Whitmire thinks that this is a point in his favor. That, well, if you don't shut it down now, it's going to shut down anyway. Okay, then let the people shut it down. That's fine. This is America. That's the way it's supposed to go anyway. The government follows us. We don't follow the government. Like I was saying, the travel data, you remember we were having this discussion about how they actually showed that travel dropped off substantially. And I'm not even talking about like air travel. I'm talking about just going back and forth in your car. People did quarantine by themselves without a governor t telling them that they had to. And you know what else? The governors started opening up about a week or week and a half after people pretty much got back to traveling the way that they had beforehand. The government follows us. We don't follow it. This is America. This is the one place that is based off of the idea that we're the one that leads the government, not the other way around. And Whitmire would rather have the governor force us to shut down because he thinks it's what's best. Ultimately, that's the problem here.
is that Whitmire thinks he and everybody else is so much smarter and can make so much better decisions. Look, if Whitmire wants to brick himself off in his basement and work from there for the rest of his career, that's no skin off my hide. I don't care. But don't tell other people that they're not allowed to work and they're not allowed to bring in income just because it's something that doesn't suit you. I mean, that's the whole idea of freedom, isn't it? That you get to make your own decisions and other people get to make their own decisions. And at the end of the day, you respect that. That's what liberty looks like. Furthermore, and this is the thing that is really irritating about this. Now, I know we didn't read the entire article, but believe me, I wouldn't be saying this if it hadn't been excluded from Kyle Whitmire's consideration here. Did you notice anything about the stats? The stats that he chose, the ones that we were reading? You notice anything about those? Anybody? He included deaths, and even though he horribly botched it, included hospitalizations as well. You know what stat he didn't include? Deaths. Why would he not include deaths? Isn't that the most important one? Isn't if, if the whole purpose of this and the whole purpose of shutdowns is to save lives, why would he not include deaths? See, because he only included stats that he thought would help him make his case. If you focus on cases, it looks really bad. If you look at deaths, it turns out we're really not in bad shape. So that's one of the things that is, is a big deal here. So first of all, let's go back to why he would have wanted to choose cases. Why is there such a substantial uptick in cases? Well, there's a number of different factors. One thing is that just more people are getting sick and more people have the virus. That is certainly true. But another thing that is probably a significant contributing factor is testing. We're testing way more than we did back when Kyle Whitmire is trying to compare us to back in the end of May. So let's go ahead and, and compare and look at our testing that, that we were doing now and, and that we were doing then. So this is the 28-day average daily test from April the 23rd to May the 21st. So this would have been the last month of the shutdown because remember, Kyle Whitmire is the one that set the bar there. That's where he chose to compare us to. And because of that, I'm going to use that same measurement. 5,002. That was how many people we were testing on a daily basis on average in that month. Now, let's look at our average daily test for this month. 8,459. That is an increase of 3,457, or 69% more than we were testing at the time. Okay, well, that does make a pretty substantial difference, doesn't it? If we're testing a lot more people, yeah, the cases are going to be a lot higher. I know this may be difficult for Kyle Whitmire to understand, but that is the way that this works. Is it the only factor? No, I genuinely do believe that there are also more people that have the virus and we're having more positive cases because more people do have it. I'm not saying that's not the case, but I'm saying if you increase your testing by 69%, that's going to have a substantial ramification for the final number. And so that accounts for at least part of it. That accounts for at least some of the case increase that we're seeing because our testing is significantly more robust and easier than it was at the time that he's trying to compare us to. Now, let's go ahead and look at this stat as well when we actually look at the deaths, because the risk of death is way, way lower for this thing than the date in which Kyle Whitmire is trying to compare to. So let's look at the 28-day average of deaths for uh, the 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 time period in which Kyle Whitmire is trying to measure. So if you're looking at before the day that he is looking at, so the month, the last month of the shutdown, you get 11.9 deaths. But if you look at the month after the shutdown, uh, that's going to give you a different measure. So we'll look at that in a second. Um, if you look at the 28 daily deaths for right now, 26.8. Okay, well, that seems to be a point in Kyle Whitmire's favor, doesn't it? I mean, 26 is obviously significantly more deaths per day than back when the shutdown ended. Oh, wait, but there was also a month after the shutdown. So directly after the shutdown, which he seems to not have any contention or at least doesn't voice it, 
in this article with Kay Ivey about not maintaining a shutdown. Now, maybe he did at the time. Uh, yeah. So back in the month after the shutdown, so late May and early June, 28.6. And so we were actually seeing more deaths on average back in the summer right after the shutdowns ended. See, Kyle Whitmire doesn't want to talk about that. Our deaths have actually decreased despite the fact that we've got way more cases now than we did at the time. That's the thing that people on the left that are crying we need to go ahead and shut down are completely ignoring. Our treatment of this thing has gotten significantly better through things like therapeutics and just through knowledge. I mean, the idea that this is a newer treatment uh, that, that came out after that time period that we're talking about, just learning that it may help to roll a patient over on their belly so that they can breathe a little easier. I mean, things as simple as that have greatly increased our ability to treat this thing without it becoming fatal. And so because of that, even with a substantial increase in cases, our deaths look really pretty much the same as they did in June when we keep hearing about this big lull that was happening, which, by the way, it was. I'm not arguing with that. Uh, but when we, we talk about, oh, back in the summer, and then they try to compare it like Kyle Whitmire did, they're comparing cases but not deaths because we were having more deaths then even though we had substantially less people with the virus at that time. And when it comes to that and when we're talking about a risk assessment kind of uh, standard for this, let's look at the fatality rate. So the average fatality rate for the same time period that Kyle Whitmire is measuring, the last month of the shutdown that ended on May 21st, it was 0.45 if you adjust for the CDC's estimate. So this is the fatality rate for this month, November through December, 0.13. That's a decrease of 0.32%. In other words, when the the last month of the shutdown was taking place, the time that Kyle Whitmire is trying to call back to and say, oh, we were in so much better shape back then, and look how horrible the shape we're in now is. Yeah, actually, the fatality rate was 3.5 times larger then than it is now. So good job, Kyle Whitmire. Again, he doesn't want to talk about this. He doesn't want to talk about deaths. He doesn't want to talk about fatality because the second that you do, you realize, oh, actually, we're really not in any danger or at least not significantly more danger than we were at the time period he's trying to compare us to. See, that's the folly of central planning. They really do believe that if we just hit the right combination of shutdown and masking and all these things, that we'll just have no deaths, that it'll all go away. That's not realistic. It's not possible. And the reason that I know that is because you can look all over the world and get a similar result. So there has been no data whatsoever so far that suggests that the shutdowns actually do decrease the net number of cases or deaths. It can slow them down, it can flatten the curve, but it can actually cause less people to get sick and less people to die from that sickness. That has been shown over and over and over again. Right now, spikes are happening everywhere, even the places that are shut down. A lot of European countries, including the UK and Germany, are locked down really tight and have been for a while. California never fully reopened, and they're seeing a spike too. Just like Germany, just like the UK. Of all places, I frankly didn't think this was going to happen, but even New York is seeing another spike. Even though they're locked down really tight, we're seeing spikes in Michigan, we're seeing spikes all over the world. Whether you have a shutdown or not doesn't seem to affect whether or not you're going to have a spike. Now, again, maybe it can make that spike last longer and just be less intense, but it's still going to result in the same amount of people, and the spike is still going to happen one way or the other. Right now, in New York and Illinois, and this is why it's important to compare deaths as well as case rates, right now in New York and Illinois, both of those states are seeing a substantial increase in total deaths. You know what place is actually continuing a steady decline in death rate? Florida, which is wide open and has not reenacted any shutdown measures. Now, maybe that changes in, you know, some time from now. But the point is, we've been in this spike for about two, two or three weeks. And despite that, you've got some states that are open that are not seeing increases in death rate and some states that are shut down that are, are seeing an increase in death rate. 
the shutdowns do not have an effect on this. None of the data suggests that that is the case. And even the, even the WHO, the World Health Organization, they came out about a month, month and a half ago and said, look, these shutdown measures, they are stalling tactics. They are not a measure to control the virus because you can't control the virus. That's not possible. And they actually said, quit thinking of the shutdowns as a control mechanism because that's not what it does. If you do have a situation, and remember, this is the narrative that we were originally told back when all this started, if you do have a problem with not having enough preparation, not having enough medical staff, or not having the medical resources and facilities to handle a giant spike in cases, then yes, a shutdown may very well be in order in order to try to, and I'm not even talking about a government-mandated shutdown, I'm just talking about people being cautious, but that may be in order if you need to slow the, the amount of time so the system can kind of absorb it over a longer period of time. The problem with that is that there's been no indication whatsoever that that's a problem this time. Whitmire is basically just saying, increase in cases, therefore we need another shutdown. And he does mention hospitals, but he uses garbage stats and doesn't explain that. Now, if Kyle Whitmire can come to me and say, look, and, and not use anecdotal evidence and say, well, there may have been some hospitals that ran out of ICU beds. Now, that's not what I'm talking about. Come to me with actual math and actual data and say, look, this is Alabama's overall ICU capacity. This is where we are. This is where we're projected to be. And where we're projected to be exceeds where we will have to be. And so that's why we need to flatten the curve and enact another shutdown. Then I'm open to listening, but he hasn't done that. He's basically just said, oh, increase in cases. Therefore, we need another shutdown. No, you're going to have to do that. And then you're also going to have to explain to me that the risk, the, you're going to have to do a risk versus reward analysis and explain to me that the shutdown is going to be less costly than the price of, of whatever price we're going to have to pay when it comes to doing the shutdown. You can't just make these claims and suggest that because we've seen an increase in cases that that's enough and that means we have to shut everything down. That's simply not how this works. But ultimately, this is the problem. Whitmire's shutdown fetish does not originate from feelings. Or sorry, it does not originate from facts. It originates from feelings. He feels as though this is the right thing to do. Therefore, he believes that it is correct. Because if you were looking at the facts and looking at the data, the data does not support his conclusion. It's just as simple as that.